Testing, one, two, three. <laughs> All right, good morning, everybody. We're going to get started. And music, ITF 92. Note well, I think you all know it. Uh, if you don't, please go ahead and read it very carefully. Uh, just a few administrative things first. Blue sheets. We'll pass those around. You guys know the drill. Don't pass it across the middle aisle, one on each side. We already have a Java scribe, that's uh, Jonathan Lennox. Thank you, Jonathan, or Relay, I should say. And we have two note takers, Boo Bo Berman and Thomas Stuck. So thank you guys for volunteering for that. Uh, also remember, when you do speak, uh, the microphone, first of all, please use the microphone and then state your name. And then we have a little uh, note here telling us that apparently there's a little pink box that you have to look at. And please, is it yellow? All right. Well, whatever the box is, you know, please make sure you stand inside the box when you do speak. So before we get into the uh, business of the day, uh, we have a little thing that we want to cover here. First things first, if we could have a uh, whoever is present of the chairs from uh, Straw, Insipid, and uh, BFCP BIS, please uh, come forward. And uh, if we have Richard, Richard, please stand up. Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, you know, our outgoing area director. Um, if you could come forward here as well. I think uh, we have a little thing for you. And uh, everybody, you may clap now. <laughs> so uh, we heard you like wine. So um, in the interest of you not having to uh, lug too much back, we thought we'd pull a little bit together. So thank you very much, Richard. Hey guys. I don't have to do a picture of it. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> a little blurry. All right, 
I'll just uh, go through it here while uh, Ari plays around with the projector. Agenda for today, introduction and status update as we're doing right now. Then we will get into the SCTP-based media transport and SDP. Then we'll talk about media multiplexing, the uh, bundle draft. We'll talk a little bit about SDP bis uh, then get into some of the data channel negotiation. Keith is going to take us through that. And then finally today, IANA registrations of the STP proto attributes for um, RTP media over TCP. Uh, Suhas is going to cover that. On Friday, please note that we do have a change on the agenda here. Uh, it's not on the online agenda yet. We'll get that uploaded after this meeting. Basically, we added, we had some offline discussion with Harold on the uh, MSID draft. So Harold is going to uh, basically start off on Friday for half an hour. So everything else has been pushed out by half an hour. So we will talk about MSID first there. Then we'll get into simulcast, ISBIS, dual stack fairness, and finally, uh, improvements to ICE candidate nomination. Any comments on the agenda? All right. Then we will proceed with the working group status. Uh, we have not been as productive, I guess, this time around as the previous time, so we don't have any RFCs that have been published. We still have uh, a couple of the same RFCs in the editor's queue, um, RTSP-related drafts, essentially. Uh, Magnus is back from his leave now, so that is on his list. I think he's pretty busy working on updating and uh, moving these forward, so um, hopefully we'll uh, have some uh, good news to report on those by the next meeting. Last call and publication requested. We don't have either, uh, not any drafts there either. In working group last call, the MUX attributes draft already went through that. Uh, the chairs basically had the action to look closer at that and get the write-ups done for that. Uh, similarly with the SCTP, STP, we did a working group last call on that one as well. Uh, there are still some topics to be discussed. Um, MSID, as, as we mentioned here, uh, we've had some discussion, as you may have seen on the list, and uh, have some proposals, hopefully, for how to move forward with uh, that one. So hopefully we can get that one to work in group last call pretty quickly. Took on a couple of new work items per the last meeting and subsequent mailing list confirmation. Um, the STP negotiation of data channel sub-protocols. Uh, again, Keith is going to take us through that today, and uh, simulcast, which uh, Bo will take us to. One thing I want to uh, point out, because we didn't actually see a declaration go to the mUsic list for some reason, but there was an IPR declaration submitted on the working group draft. As you may recall, previously the individual draft that formed the original baseline version for the simulcast draft had some IPR against it. There were two different uh, companies claiming IPR on it. Uh, we still have now an IPR declaration on the working group draft, uh, given that this inf information was not available when the uh, working group draft was adopted. We just wanted to point that out. So if uh, anybody has any concerns with that, you know, please let us know. We sent a um, mail to the mailing list on that as well. Um, so MSID actually is on the agenda now, so we should have removed that one. Sorry about that. Um, traffic class for SDP uh, is not on the agenda either uh, this time around. In terms of uh, reviews of drafts with uh, STP attributes, we had the uh, splicing notification drafts reviewed by Dan Wing. Thank you, Dan. And then we had a couple of uh, DVB uh, broadcast related attributes. Uh, there was no document associated with it, though, but they requested a registration of those, uh, given that there was no document um, that was rejected. So, you know, maybe we'll see those in the future. So that is it. So we are ready for. The next person, Krister. Can I? Can oh, sorry, Keith. Yep. Yeah, I just wanted to draw your attention to the fact that in AVTX yesterday we had an author draft. Um, draft P had Thatcher um, something something he said, which I think is going to need some coordination with the M Music Group if we do decide to proceed with it. We haven't decided at the moment yet to proceed with it, but. Sorry, what was the name of that draft again? Um, draft P had Thatcher um, something he said. It's in AVTX. Um, but I think it's going to need some work with the uh, music group to work out what to do with it, if anything. Thank you. Okay. Could you send us a mail just uh, with that? Thank you, Keith. Yeah. Um, anything else? No, just a short comment, if I can comment. Uh, I think we had a we, we did have a working group last call for bundle also. I don't think that was mentioned in your slides, but. But maybe that was even before the previous meeting. I think meeting, it was so. before, yeah. yeah. 
Okay, so, uh, so this is the uh, SDP, the, the offer answer for, for negotiating SCP based dreams. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we did a working group's last call for this also. Thank you for those who, who provided comments. Uh, Paul Kusevet has given comments throughout, uh, the, wor throughout the journey of this, and, and also Magnus gave a lot of comments. Uh, they were mostly editorial, so I'm not going to go through the issues here. I have, uh, I, I believe I have addressed most of them on, on the mailing list, uh, so I, I will soon submit a new version of the draft, and hopefully uh, we're done. But there's actually one issue that has came up. Uh, it's actually the discussion started in, in RTC Web, and I guess we're going to discuss more of it here on, on Friday. But I'm going to mention it now because it does have an impact on, or it most likely have an impact on, on, on this draft. Uh, so what I would like to figure out really is, is how we're going to deal with that, whether we have to you know, hold this document or whether we can tweak some wording or something. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, those of you have, it's also been now on the music list, there's been a discussion about something which is called virtual connection. That's the, that's the thing we, we, we've been talking about. And basically, if you go to the, if you go to the next slide, I will. basically this is text we have today in regarding DTLS connections in 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 the draft. And the important thing here is the first sentence, which is in, in bold, which says that if the underlying transport protocol is modified, the endpoint must establish a new DTLS connection. Basically, what that means, if you're moving from one five tuple to another one, then you have to create a new DTLS connection. Now the issue with this is that then when people say, okay, we have eyes where you, where you can have multiple five tuples active at one time, you should be able to move from one, you know, eyes candidate pair to another one without, and you should basically be able to have one DTLS connection which cover or spans over all those five tuples. So if you go to the next slide, please. Uh, so you can have multiple five tuples. Each candidate pair basically is one five tuple. Uh, and the main use case is obviously ICE. This is where this has come up from. And as I said, you could have a DTLS connection that can span over virtual connections. So maybe single DTLS connection, you could basically send client hello on one five tuple. You get a server hello on another one. You send your payload on, on one five tuple and, and you receive on another one. Be depending on, uh, then of course, how you choose the five tuple, that's ICE specific and, and outside the scope of this. And this is just trying to, to show what I hear. Here you have a few five tuples. Basically, they are representing ICE candidate pairs. You know, the top one could be, you know, host candidates, so, you know, whatever. But you have a single DTLS connection for all of those. So next slide, please. Uh, and I think we, we're going to need some more discussion. I mean, the purpose of this presentation here is not really to define this virtual connection. There has been some discussion, okay, what is the scope? Is it an M line? Could you have multiple M lines and put everything into one details connection? That's really not the purpose here. What I want to figure out really is that how this affect the, the, this, this draft. Like I said, do we need to put it on hold, or can we tweak this text somehow, which I showed earlier? Maybe you can go back a few slides to, to show that text. Uh, one more, yeah. Or do we think that, okay, if we define this virtual connection concept, does this text conflict with that, or is this text okay? Because when we have this virtual connection, you know, we could say that the underlying transport is not changed, so everything is fine. So, <laughs> that's, so I, that's basically what I have to say as far as presentation is concerned. So now I'm happy to, you know, get some feedback on, on what to do. Yeah, okay. So um, do we have questions from the working group? Oh, this is a pretty new concept to begin with. I mean, the thread on M music list hasn't, has been going only for like a week or a few weeks. So obviously we haven't had much discussion yet. So, so, Colin Jennings, um, I, I mean, <laughs> one, one of the whole ideas of ICE was you could hand over from a cellular connection to a non-cellular connection or something like that, and you could do make before break, and that you could do this quickly. And it seems like if you reestablish the DTLS connection, I mean, that's obviously, that takes a while to do the handshake because of the crypto and the number of round trips. Um, you know, you're going to have a real break in your audio media while this is happening. 
Well, the other option was that you have a separate DTLS connection for each file tuple and you establish those from the beginning so you can switch without having to reestablish. But I guess that's something that people did not want either. So, so they want a single DTLS connection, which... Right, but I think, th but uh, why, why do we, need, if, even with a single DTLS connection, I don't understand why we would need to reestablish when you switched which one of the five tuples you were using. No, no, I mean, uh, that, that's enough the thing, but the text here says that when the transport protocol is modified, basically when you're, when, 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 for example, the five tuple and the IP address is part of the transport protocol properties. When that switch, you basically would have to reestablish a DTLS connection. So, so the thing is, this text here, how, how, how should we, and if should we modify this text in order to cover that? I'm not really here. I, I do agree having this single DTLS connection is a good thing. That's not yeah. what I'm here to say. Uh, I just want to know how we can make this text be, fit that concept. I mean, I, 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 I guess, I, I, mean, I think it, my knee-jerk reaction without having thought about this deeply is that this text should be changed to say um, that you should, you know, continue using the existing DTLS connection um, when the underlying uh, transports change. I mean, we should say almost the opposite of what this says. Um, anyway, I, I'll let other people out the mic. Stay with it. Uh, so, uh, John Monix, uh, first relaying for Paul Kisvet on Jabber. Um, this draft may or may not be affected. Uh, we need some more discussion on the virtual connection before we can decide. And then relaying for Randall Jessup on Jabber, we should modify the text to avoid restarting the detail DTLS connection and agree with Colin. Um, and then speaking for myself, I mean, I would agree that we should avoid restarting the DTLS connection whenever possible. Um, my one concern is that there are cases where you do really need to restart, which is the cases where you've done, you're actually talking to a different far end uh, entity, and I'm not quite sure how you actually detect that. I mean, I even, I mean, even ICE restart, I think, is too, too aggressive a, a reestablish, I think, but I'm not quite sure what the right answer is. Well, that's actually something which is currently discussed on the list, and, and also, as you said, because there was a discussion about, okay, okay, should the scope of this single virtual connection be, for example, one M line and each candidate which is associated with that, or could it be more than one M line? But of course, each M line could be actually have a different IP address completely. It could be different devices, so you can't have a single DTLS connection which goes to different devices. That that doesn't work. So 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 I think what what uh, people have said this should be per M line because everything which is associated with an M line is the same, you know, physical device in one way or another. So. Harald Alderström, just having gone over this and uh, trying to make sense of RTC web transport, I suggest adding a new paragraph saying, note that changing candidate pairs within an, an ICE association is not considered modifying the, trans the, the, the underlying transport protocol. Changing to a new ICE connection would be modifying the underlying transport protocol. Switching from ICE to something not, not ICE would be modifying the underlying transport protocol. Switching candidate pairs would not be considered modifying the transport protocol. That is, ICE is a transport protocol. Sure, and, and, and that's, that's really what this virtual connection is all about, and, I, and that's going to be described somewhere, but I don't think this draft is not the right place to define the virtual connection concept as such. People have suggested the uh, ISBs, for example, for that, so I guess this would be referencing that. Uh, Jonathan, I think, I mean, I agree that, um, you know, uh, w you know in, within a given offer answer exchange, and I, the scope of an ICE virtual connection is the M line, or really one component of the M line, but that's not relevant for DTLS. Um, what's not clear to me is what the scope of it is over time. As you do, um, say, a nice restart, is that the same ICE virtual connection or a new virtual connection? That's, that's what's really not clear to me. Yes. So I guess, I mean, what I think, I think, I mean, there's, we, we're going to need some more discussion about this. I don't think it's, it's, it's just in the room. Are you going to say something on Friday about this? Because, uh, because uh, this is related to the non-base non draft, which is coming up on Friday, uh, I guess. So, so. And, oh, and a relaying for Paul Kesevet. What Harold said, it belongs with DTLS, not with this draft. Sorry? Harold says, sorry, Paul says, what, what Harold says belongs with DTLS, not with this draft. I'm, I'm not quite sure. 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, um, I think I agree with Harold's conclusion of what should happen, <laughs> but but I, I think that trying to define, like, you start sending on a new five tuple isn't changing the underlying transport. I think we should choose other words for that. It would just be too confusing to to consider that to be not changing the transport. Um, I think we need to explain to people here something different, you know, what needs to happen in very specific terms. There you are, Justin. Are you going to talk about this virtual connection on Friday? As part of Numbis? Uh, I was, wasn't planning on covering as part of Numbis, but um, I was going to talk, make a slide for it separately. Excellent, excellent. Please do that. I'm just mentioning it here because uh, we're discussing how it's going to affect this SCTP STP draft where we have this current text. So, so but I, I guess the outcome is we're going to have to wait with this draft for a while and we, uh, until we get more more meat on this virtual connection and, and, and then, you know, update this accordingly. Yes, because, I mean, the whole concept is pretty new and we have only started to discuss it and explore it. So it would be way, way too early to know even what it's going to be about. So, yeah, but if we can have some initial idea, what, what can we agree on? The, I, what is virtual connection? What is defined by and how does it affect? I mean, that would be helpful. And then we can, if we can now have, have some hunch of it and maybe then on Friday. Yeah, do you want to set aside 10 minutes on the agenda um, on Friday to talk about the, this virtual connection stuff and I can prepare a, a two or three slides? Um, just, well, I think it would be good to have something to point to rather than sort of talking about it in plenary fashion. Yeah, I, that, that makes sense. So, yeah, let's have a 10, 10 minute slot on Friday on that. Sounds good. So, Martin Thompson, I, I have a proposal for that. I think what maybe Krista and Justin do some homework and actually produce some, like a, a concrete proposal on this that we can discuss on, on Friday and, and, and do that. Because I, I think this is, like what Harold said was, was right, and I think to answer Jonathan's question, I think if you do an ICE restart, you know, keep going. I don't want to see more DTLS handshakes in this process. That, that would be... Um, that would cause problems, but, and particularly for some of the stuff that we're working on on WebRTC, that, that could actually be serious problems. So just, you know, move on to the new five tuple if necessary, and it's the same DTLS uh, association, connection, whatever you, what have you. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't think anyone has objected to our idea as such. I mean, everybody thinks it's a good idea. I mean, it's the details, for example, how does ICE restart? impact and those kind of things. That, that's the things we need to, to, to sort out. So, but yeah. the idea as such, I guess everyone is okay with. And, and, and this text here that you're so concerned about, just say that it was wrong and then describe exactly what it should have said rather than trying to sort of weasel around it and say that it was right and then all that sort of stuff and try to redefine what it means to modify a transport protocol. And just you know, tell it how it is. Don't don't muck around. Um, update the draft that has this sentence in it, and move on. Yeah, I, I would just mention that I think we've known this for a very long time. We've been there have been lots of protocols that have incorporated DTLS without needing the five tuple, right? Like an EAP, it just uses datagrams and moves stuff around. And this has been this has been known for a very long time. Uh, so um, I guess the one thing we do, this is the point I was trying to make before, is I agree with Martin in general that ICE restart shouldn't cause a new t detail S, but there are cases where you really are talking to somebody new, you know, because you have third party call control scenarios or whatever. So you do need a restart detail S, and I'm trying to figure out how you detect that. It might be a fingerprint change. Um, that, that, might, that might be sufficient. Um, the other thing I did want to say is this is actually an SCTP draft, not a DTL S draft. Um, it is possible we want to recommend at least that when your, your underlying five tuple changes, you tell your SCTP stack that its notion of the congestion state and the MTU state and whatnot might, it might have changed. Um, now obviously this could happen in, even if you don't change your five tuple because of route flaps or whatever. So hopefully any stack can handle this, but it might be a useful recommend, implement, implement a recommendation to, hey, you know, your world has changed underneath you, you know, react to that please. I mean, that might be one of those, you know, re really should consider 
you know, um, I, I think this is a little separate, but I, I think that uh, not this draft, but um, the, the, dra the, the transport group uh, draft uh, describing the, the DTLS encapsul encapsulation in general says that you can't really rely on any of this stuff coming up from, from the DTLS. So basically, if you want to do MTU tests and those kind of things, you have to use this SCTP padding extension and all these kind of things and do it on ICTP levels. Harald Alderström, just for reference, since I spent about half an hour trying to get the right word, the word in RSC 5245 we're looking for is component. Yeah, so um, just on coming back to like when would you re-handshake DTLS, like a new fingerprint obviously is a reason to do that. Um, I think there's an open question about whether you might ever want to re-handshake DTLS for any other reason, because I don't think there's a good way to do that you know, unless you change the fingerprint. I'll mention this on Friday. Glad I came in. Um, so, I mean, I guess the first thing to do, first thing who, is... Who are you? I'm uh, uh, Justin Berti. Um, uh, yeah, Eric Rascola. For, for um, note takers, not, not Justin. Yeah, um, so, um, so I don't know actually what Justin said because I walked in, but um, there are at least two senses in which DTLS might be re-handshaked. One is you've effectively torn down the old connection and you're starting a new connection. And the other is you might be renegotiating the same connection. There is, like, all, all mention of renegotiating the same transport connection that is, um, th th that is as if, if that when you, so in, in, in TLS or DTLS, um, you can do a new negotiation encrypted by the old negotiation. All talk of that should be stricken yeah. because that is no, that will not be a sensible procedure in TLS 1.3 and we're just, and we're, and we're recommending people to do it for 1.2. Um, so the only thing that's relevant here is effectively, I completely tore everything down and I'm starting over from scratch. And um, for obvious reasons, that should be avoided if at all possible. And, and I'll hide in trouble anything in any circumstances other than a rule change, which we should discourage, or a fingerprint change, which you have to do that, that would trigger that event. And actually what we do have now when you say we have in SDP, we have the connection attribute. So I guess you could use that because basically if you say connection with a new yeah. value, that basically means that uh, you have to reestablish the, the connection. And I would assume that also applies to the details. Uh, unfortunately, uh, 5763 explicitly says must not use the connection attribute. Oh, sorry. That's for TCP. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. Which wrong? Yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I, I, I think that what we're probably sort of converging on is that Unless you change the fingerprint, you never redo DTLS. And unless anyone has any reason to think that that's not acceptable, like that's probably what we end up going with. Yeah. So, so Martin Thompson, I think if if you're in the situation where you want to somehow reuse a particular five tuple for the purposes of this, and you can't change the fingerprint, you know, too bad. Um, I, I think that's the only reasonable way out of this because doing re-handshaking or another DTLS handshake on the same connection is just going to break unimaginable amounts of things. Right. I mean, it's, it's absolutely true, as Martin just said, that like if you're going to like, like, try, like even if you change the fingerprint, attempting to reuse the same transport parameters for two DTLS connections in parallel is not going to make you happy. Um, like you're gonna, the stack is gonna have a complete flip out. Um, you've got to be able to demux those. Um, um, I mean, at some point we could add a demux, a demux identifier, but we're not. We have, no one's done that. So like, um, as far as this connection thing, um, I, I do seem to remember saying don't use connection. Um, um, I suspect actually, if we decided we had to have that, we probably could just update the document because I don't think I, my suspicion is everybody who does DTLS simply ignores the connection attribute one way or the other, and so we, the behavior, I mean, the behavior you get would be. The behavior you get would affect, um, sorry, maybe the aspect. I don't think anybody really has support for changing the fingerprint and doing anything useful with it other than just choking, even now. Um, I don't think, no, no, we don't. And so we're sort of free to invent a new mechanism for saying restart if we wish to have such a new mechanism. Are you in queue or hanging out at the mic? I, I, it, go ahead. Uh, yeah, what I was just going to say is my one cons other concern is, if the, I don't know if it's ever going to happen, but if there's ever a scenario where you know, for whatever reason, your DTLS has just like completely failed, gone out of sync, and you want to retry from scratch, which I think is what Connection New was originally intended for for TCP. I don't know, maybe that can never happen because if you've gotten that far out of sync, you probably don't have any reason to expect a new new DTLS would work either. But I'm not familiar enough with. I mean, obviously, with you know, I'm sure every DTLS stack has bugs. So 
because uh, all software has bugs. But um, so I mean, I, that would be the one use case I would see for wanting to st start over from scratch with the same fingerprint. Uh, so, on, uh, I mean, it makes sense that the, finger, the fingerprint changing is the thing that causes you to reinitiate, but um, in many cases, only one side is going to see the fingerprint change, and so we're going to have to make sure that doesn't interact badly with the act pass stuff, so that the side that saw the change can, it is allowed to go and reinitiate the DTLS connection. Uh, yeah, so I'm relaying for Paul saying, um, must deal with third-party call control transfer. And I think the fingerprint change handles that, unless for some godforsaken reason you have third-party call control between two people with the same private key, which I hope you, I really hope you don't have. Yeah, so, so Martin Thompson, I'm, I'm thinking more about the fingerprint change thing. And I, I, going back to the DMARX problem, I think this is going to require a significant amount more thought about how we, how we approach that. I would, I would suggest that we take the third party core control thing and the fingerprint change and punt because there's 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 demons in this particular thing if if you do a re DTLS re handshake on the, on the same five tuple or the same logical transport or whatever you want to call it it's going to interfere with the old one and you're going to be doing trial decryption for for payloads and all sorts of other no, other no, horrific mess yes. yeah Go get on. a new Transport, I think, is the, at, at this point, yeah, top, top to bottom, which means you, you'd have to couple the fingerprint change with a nice restart or yeah, uh, a new media section or something. I don't, I don't actually know what, what uh, the right thing is there. Yeah, um, I don't think I'd recommend that if, if, if to solve that DMOX case, you'd have to say if you're changing your fingerprint, you also have to do an ICE restart and you have to not reuse your previous active candidate. You need a fresh active candidate. Yeah. For, for, you know, fresh candidate on whatever, on the, yeah. whatever that interface is. I, 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 I would concur. I would concur with that. Um, I guess the, the 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 one question I should have in my head is: Are there actual reasons, like, are there actual reasons why you would wish to do a new details negotiation, other than um, other than because basically your call failed and you're starting starting a new call? Because, I mean, or because your fingerprint changed for some reason, right? But, I mean, the, the point being that it's one thing to say, if the fingerprint changed, then you need to do a new handshake. That seems like natural, right? Um, and it's another thing to say that there's all these valid reasons to do a new handshake, none of which I can currently think of, really. Um, and in order to do that, you've got to use the fingerprint as a signal. That last one that seems clunky. If we can think of a lot of reasons why you should do a new handshake, we should invent some mechanism to say I want a new handshake. But the only ones I'm aware of um, that you actually wish to be involved with are like... Um, are like traffic key updating, and um, we're get doing that separately in 1.3 and in 1.2. You don't do that. You do that by you do that. By, like, you you wouldn't do a whole new handshake. You do something different, right? So, so I don't really think that. Um, so, so I guess my point is I can't think of a reason why you want to do a handshake. Sorry, maybe I could think of some reason, but um, I, I'm, unless unless there's some, some reason why you want to do a new handshake for itself, um, then probably this is okay. Um. So again, relaying for Paul, he says saying punt on third-party call control is unacceptable. And then for myself, I mean, I think we probably we're speaking um, uh, for, for security guys. When we say new handshake, we don't actually mean new handshake. We mean start an entirely new DTLS association. The fact that uh, you know, sorry, we, we, we uh, it's, let me just take this out so I can actually look at the person I'm talking to while being online. Um, so I, I think what we mean is start DTLS over from scratch. I mean, we don't mean in-band new handshake. We mean start over from scratch. And I think the only reasons are you're talking to somebody new, you know, either actually new or they've chosen to assume a new identity, or because everything has completely fallen over and you want to try again. Those are the only two use cases I could see for doing that. Sorry, Jonathan, real quick. Um, I missed your comment. Did you say that you also said that uh, we have to have third-party call control for it? Um, Paul said we had that third -party. Okay, but you didn't say it. Uh, I, I mean, I think it's good. I, you did I say agree, it. I agree with him, but I was relaying for him when I said it. Okay, but are you both saying it? I see the question. Yes. Um, but, but fingerprint change is that, because right. third-party control better have a fingerprint change or you're seriously broken security-wise. Right, so I guess, so, right, so if the, I mean, 
if you're targeting a new person, then you're, set, then you're presumably setting up new transport, then, then presumably that's straightforward. And if you're, if the connections like totally fall over and you're, re you're, re you're starting everything over from scratch, then, th then there's no need, if those are the only two cases where you would need to do this, then there's no need for a separate indicator because it's always implicit in context what you're going to do. Because in the second case, you might have the same fingerprint, but you still, but you, but you know, you know everything did fall apart. Okay. Um, so yeah, well. So, so just that, that sounded like we actually reached agreement on it. Did we get that in the minutes of the final conclusion of where we're going on this? I think I'm happy to try and resummarize or get people to. But you got it. Okay. Okay. So um, we're going to change this text here to, to say sort of the opposite of, of this, right? We're going we're to fix this draft to say that you, you, you don't restart the DTLS if you switch to a different component <laughs> um, on, in, in ICE. I, I think the good thing we'll do is because obviously we need to de define this virtual connection somewhere and I think it would be good to then just reference to that there as long as you are within the same virtual connection defined in wherever you know you don't switch. Uh, uh. But anyway, I, I don't think, you know, okay. I, I think that the, the important, thing, the the important thing now is to get the, the definition of the virtual connection defined, oh, right? I, so look, we've, so we've, then we've, we've been shipping this for four years. This was, a, you know, this has been done in many implementations already. Okay, it's so please send me text. Please send me text. I, I'm giving you the text the room just agreed to. And if the room does not think we agreed to this text, then come up to the mic. That's why I'm trying to close this down so we aren't discussing at the next meeting. I don't want to send text to the list. I want... I want to the minutes to reflect what we agreed to in the room. <laughs> Is that fair? Someone, someone yeah. Can send text yeah. So, uh, so Colin, can you now finish your um, your summary? Okay. So, so that that was the change on that one. And then what we're going to go do um, that that if you want to cause a DTLS re handshake for some reason, um, y you effectively y you get. Uh, Jonathan said it well, but you, 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 I mean, you need to get whole new transports and everything. You can't reuse your previous, you can't reuse the active candidates that you had before, right, if you want to cause that. And we, it's not mucking around with fingerprints or anything like that. It's just from context, you will know it's a whole new connection is how you do it. Oh, no, you don't. Right, look, lots of browsers use the same fingerprint forever. Yeah. No, um, Jonathan, no, I was, what I was saying there is that and even if you have a whole new transport connection, you don't restart in the normal case, right? This is the idea to hard handover from Wi-Fi to 3G. I'm still right. me. I don't want a fresh DTLS. Um, I'm, I'm talking about the case, you know, so that um, in order to get a fresh D, so what I, I'm trying to think about this in terms of, in terms of what I see in from the remote side, offer or answer. Do I know whether I should expect a fresh DTLS? Because that, I think, is so. I think that's an easier way of yeah. thinking about it. And I'll, you know, one case is if there's a new fingerprint. Um, a, a fingerprint, is a, a new fingerprint, is a very difficult and expensive thing to get. We yeah, can't. Yes. And the only right. reason this would happen is third-party call control scenarios. In those scenarios, there will be a new fingerprint. You have to do a fresh uh, DTLS. Period. End of story. So, so clearly, if the fingerprint changed, you need to, yeah. it's something different. Right. So what I'm trying to figure out is, right. do we want some way of signaling, absent a fingerprint change, that the other side thinks our DTLS association has completely failed, we want to start over. I, I, he, they, they want to start over. It's called a DTLS fatal alert. Yeah. Um, but can you send a fatal, so I mean, so maybe that should be handled entirely at the DTLS level and SDP should be ignorant of entirely. So, I mean, I guess the, um, the, the, the case in which, um, so, so how would, I guess the question, how would you get into the state where you wish to have that happen, right? And I think the major case in which you get to that happen is like everything is completely falling apart and like, uh, there's a bear in mind that for, so let's take, so for DTLS RDP, right, you don't actually do any DTLS after the initial call setup, it's all as RTP, right? And for the SCTP stuff, SCP or DTLS, you can, of course, continue to DTLS, right? So the, um, but, you know, both of those, bear in mind, both those failures at both those levels basically manifest themselves as the data stops flowing, right? Um, and so at, at the point where, um, um, so 
forget, let's, let's, let's forget about DTLS for one second and just talk about regular SRTP. Um, you know, we're doing a call and we get into the state where data totally stops flowing. Like, what's our, what's our actual reaction here? It's an actual reaction to attempt to, like, as, as dead or something, right? Or it's, or it's RTP. Is our actual reaction to, you know, try to restart ICE and then just start, tr pick up with RTP where we left off? Or is our actual reaction to say, this is just screwed and I'm doing a new, a new negotiation entirely? And in any case, in, in any case, in the former case, DTLS should continue to function the way it's supposed to function because the keys have already been set up and, um, and unless SCTP is actually timed out, the SCTP association is still valid as well. Um, and the DTLS has no, it doesn't have its own inherent time, it's failure timers. And in the second case, it ought to be pretty clear from context that like I'm doing an entirely fresh call, in which case DTLS ought to set itself up just for fresh ordinarily. So I'm not, I'm, I'm not quite seeing what setting we'd actually want to have a, like, a new negotiation of just the DTLS section on the same call. I don't see how that could really happen. Yeah. Right, right. So, yeah, okay. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think in a classic SIP sense, to answer Echo's question, the most successful thing to do would be a reinvite with a whole new offer with a replaces of the original session, right? Um, and, and I think that's that's what we, we had to come around to in the, the room here, right? Is we we're going to do a, a whole new thing with a new with a different port number that I base my ice stuff off of in that new offer. New UFRAG, new, new UFRAG, new everything. But, okay, but I guess, I guess, Not necessarily a new but, fingerprint. But, 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 like, but, like, but like, let me let me try to make sense of this. Um, in like, would, would there be a requirement? Okay, that's that's the wrong question. Would you, in this case, would you be a requirement that, um, I don't know, that you had the same, that you ha didn't have a fewer M lines, or is this like, so like we had audio and video before. Would the, is it is this an update or is this like it's a totally sinking new call? I mean, we have to remember, for example, if you're using bundle and, and you have your, within your bundle group, you have your virtual connection and then you can add new M lines into that bundle. No, no, I'm, I'm right. But you can never reduce, right? So my point is, my point is like, here's a standard rule from SDP, right? Which is when I, no matter how many updates I do, I can't shrink the number of M lines. And so my question is, in this context, could this new SDP have fewer M lines? Because if it could, is, is, is it a new peer connection or is it not, right? I mean, if, if it's, and so my claim is, if it's the same peer connection, it should be the same DTLS. And if it's a new peer connection, it should be a new DTLS. And I'm hoping the signaling has enough context to figure that out. <laughs> you, you cannot reduce M lines from SDP, but you can reduce M lines from a bundle group. No, I, I, I appreciate that. I, I guess I, I wish I hadn't mentioned M lines. All I'm saying is, is this, is this a update of the same call or is it a new call? Is the question I'm asking. That should be a quicker question. New call would be my vote. Okay. Um, so, just, just hang on one second. One relay for Jabber. Um, okay. Paul Kuzovic says, um, this is, should, whatever, whatever the outcome of this, it should apply um, for anywhere you're using DTLS over ICE, so this shouldn't be the only document or possibly even the document where it's specified. We need to specify this somewhere that applies to everywhere you're doing DTLS over ICE. Yeah, and uh, like I said, I think the suggestion has been that it's going to be a nice this or some, somewhere. But not, not, the mechanism itself should not be de defined in this document. I, I agree with that. So, so yeah. question for the group here. I mean, we certainly have time on the agenda, but what's the best way of closing this? I mean, we can continue having this discussion, which seems to be a fairly detailed technical discussion at the microphone, right? Let that run its course. We could have a few people, you know, meet right after this meeting and sit down, try to do that, or wait for some text update on the list. Um, what's the best way of moving forward, My, uh, Martin? Like I said, I, I, think was, just, I was just, just said he will have some slides on, on, on Friday. So. I, I was just up to summarize what I think I heard from everyone discussing here and see if anyone, anyone disagreed with it. And then I was going to propose that Krista or Justin or whoever was invested in this present us pro a proposal, a concrete proposal with, right. with like some words in it uh, on Friday. Oh, okay. I'm fine with that. I, I so my, my read was uh, within the same session as updated by multiple offerings or exchanges, whatever else, uh, you use the same DTLS connection regardless of what happens unless you update the fingerprints. If you update the fingerprints, you must also restart ICE and generate a new five tuple for that connection. Otherwise, you can have massive problems with DMARCs. Right. If you want to restart the DTLS connection for reasons other than a change of fingerprint, because it's busted in some way, then make a new session, a whole new peer connection, a whole new, um, you know, the, the replaces thing that, that 
that Floffy talked about, which means that you're completely divorced from the old session and you can do things like, as Eka suggested, drop M lines out and throw the media on the floor and it, it, it's a green field at that point. Uh, that is, I think, the, the essence of the, the discussion. And I wanted to push back on Krista, who keeps coming back to this virtual connection thing. Just use the terms we already have. I don't think you need any of those concepts unless this is already something in bundle that I am not aware of because no, it's no, changed a no. hundred times since I last read it. Okay, there, so there, there, don't invent a new concept. I don't think we need a new, new hook to hang this particular hat on. I think we have all the tools we need. That's just my preference. All right, so does anybody disagree or have any comments specifically on the summary that Martin just gave? Uh, one, one comment, scope. This is strictly about DTLS SRTP. It is not about DTLS because the DTLS RFC never uses the word file tuple. I checked, right. DTLS, it refers to datagrams and connections. It does not refer to five tuples anywhere in the document. That's true. So I, I assumed, with the, an, an obvious, and also I would be extremely upset if this working group started making levies on the TLS working group for DTLS. I'd assume this is, but I, I think it's a little more general than you just said, Harold. I think it's DTLS in the context of being, when it's run, being run over ICE via, um, um, so it also would apply to DTL, SCTP over DTLS as well. Um, in the, in, but in that case, you don't need a modification to anything because a, an ICE component is a, is a DTLS datagram connection. Um, you, need, you just need to say that it's an ICE comp that the DTLS in this case runs over an ICE component. I would have to think about where, well, I mean, is that, is that in fact, hmm. I mean, the, the, the relevant factor we want is that ICE restart cause, uh, I, I, ICE restart does not cause DTLS resets. Um, um, yeah, so I think if, if you think that if you think that, that what you just said causes that inference, let's take a step back. I agree with Martin's position about when things happen under various conditions. I'm still like, not quite sure how to phrase that in the document to, so that it makes sense um, because of the reasons you just raised. Okay, go go to Friday. <laughs> so are, are we saying that um, if you want to change the fingerprint, you also have to do an ICE restart, or? And, and, or are we saying that if you get a you know, new fingerprint, then you should tr use it as a trigger for restarting ICE? So the problem that we have is if we have two DTLS connections on the same yeah. transport, you know, same, same five tuple, you have big problems trying to distinguish the packets for one from the other one. And then you have to do things like trial decryption or uh, some sort of extra DMUX markers or something like that. It's a mess. Don't do that. Make sure you get a new five tuple for that. And ICE restart is the way we do that. No, but yeah, that, but that's that. We understand that, right? right? I think that. The, but let, let me give an example. I have a DTLS connection. For some reason, I stop it. Right now, now they they come up with different certificates or something. I open a new one. Does that force a nice restart? I think the answer is no. Why would it? Yeah. Yeah. Why would you need to restart? I'm not even convinced, Justin and Bertie, I'm not even convinced that uh, ICE Restart fixes things, though, because ICE Restart is make before break. So, or you, you might still get stuff over your old thing. I, I think this is actually really complicated. And um, to be honest, like, I think probably we should have a couple of us just down and try to nail down exactly what, what needs to happen here. Yeah, I, I, could, I, I just, just Martin acknowledging Justin's comment, I think we could make that work, but it would be ugly. Um, I, again, relaying for Paul Kisvet, um, that the discussions being framed in the POV of the offer must also be able to figure out if you're the answerer. So we need to make sure that we, whatever we describe work, makes sense regardless of which role you're in. Small 
Um, I've been listening to the, this whole discussion and it doesn't really answer my question that I had when I created the big thread on a mailing list. Um, my question was uh, in the context of DTLS SRTP, okay? When you establish a DTLS connection, you extract the keying material and you bind that SRTP keying material to the five tuple that was used by the DTLS connection. So if you start receiving SRT packets from a different ICE candidate, then you won't be able to decrypt them. So, Colin Jenks, um, if you do that, you will be, it will not interoperate with some of the products that are shipped today that will start sending you the same the part will start, we will shift as they find better ICE components, they will shift the five tuple being used and they expect the DTLS not to be found down bound to the five tuple. I'm not saying that's exactly. what the specs say or anything. I'm saying that's what you need to do if you want it to work. Absolutely. So um, if you start binding your keying material to the three tuple, then you cannot handle uh, zip forks. Uh, no, you're, you're binding to component. Um, because, um, I mean, I guess even broader than that, because um, RTP and RTCP share keying material, even if you're not muxing, but because, because you're establishing session keys. So, yeah, no, you're binding, I think, what you're binding to is, what you're binding to is the, um, the, I, I, the, the thing that was the M line before bundle and now is the bundle group, I think. I'd say it as you're binding to the ICE connection. So when the ICE, when the when you get the path, the UFRAGs and passwords from the other side, you formed a connection, and there are a bunch of components in that connection. If you had a forking situation, you'll have two ICE connections. You'll have a separate ICE connection. Yeah, you're receiving it all on the same ports, and they're moving around, and it's multiple Sorry. underlying five tuples. Yeah, but so it's the connection that you need to bind it to. Exactly. So the proposal was to, as soon as you have received a an authenticated UFRAG from somebody else, then you take that five tuple and add it to the ICE virtual transport. And then you bind your keying material or DTLS connection or whatever is stateful to that thing, that virtual transport. Right, and I think there's lots of people have implemented that in the past and thought that that I know, was a way. I know, we just yeah. need text to. Okay, yep. And just to let uh, Colin, Colin know, you're using component wrong. The, you, you actually mean candidate pair. Component is the thing that we're calling that special. Thank thing. you. Sorry. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so it sounds like uh, the way forward is for a few people to sit down. We're going to ask Krister to take the lead, organize that, uh, sit down, discuss further, see if you can come up with a concrete proposal for Friday, and report back to the group. And also, uh, I'd like to remind there are like two different things to do here. One is what goes to this draft, and one is the solution underneath. So, um, if we can have those somewhat independent, that we can actually move forward with this draft, that would be, of course, nice. I mean, I, I, I'll s regarding the text in this draft, I, I'll send something out on the list. To, to okay, thank you. So, oh. Krista will take a lead on that and hopefully maybe right after this session you guys can sit down and bash this. Um, I think that's all I had on, on this one. Yeah. Okay. So next up, Ali. Sorry. Um, yeah, we have... Yeah. <laughs> Okay, bundle, and hopefully this is the last time I 
we talk about this in the meeting. I wasn't even supposed to talk about it here. Uh, we've had a, we had one working group last call. There were a lot of comments. Again, thank you to everyone who, who, who provided comments. Again, they were mostly editorial. They were also, and there was quite a substantial number of changes. A new version has been submitted, but we, uh, so I think we're going to need a, just in case, for a second working group last calls because there's been quite a many changes. Uh, there are no major issues, but there are a couple of things which have been hanging around. They come up on the mailing list every now and then. Nobody really says anything about one or two people. So that's why I brought it here now, because we really need to, you know, once for all, get it done so, so we can publish this document. Uh, so there are two things. Uh, one which actually came up now. Uh, I think we discussed it earlier also, but ne nothing ever happened. But now when, uh, when Magnus did the working group last call, he, he brought it up. And the other one is the future of the bus offer. Uh, so let's go next slide, please. This is what Magnus said, actually. Uh, um, basically, how the, the way you, you calculate the bandwidth uh, today in bundle is, yeah, in, in a bundle group, you take the bandwidth that you need for each M line and, and, and you summarize it. But then you have this um, bandwidth, these spe special bandwidth parameters in SDP. For example, you have the CT. Uh, and Magnus' proposal is that we do need to have some text about this. Uh, and uh, for CT, for example, his proposal is that we should not, if you, if you get those on M level, you should not sum them. And we should even recommend to, to put it on a, on a session level. Uh, then uh, for the for the RR and RS, the, the RTC specific ones, uh, I, I think I, I was hoping that he was going to be here. Uh, that his proposal is because I asked him what he really means with it, but I, I didn't get any. Hold on. I let Jonathan come up and comment. So I was, Martin Thompson, I was I was going to comment on this. On oh, this sorry. I was. I'll send you a link to the uh, IETF memes page that explains this. Um, just do what Magnus says. Seems reasonable to me. Yeah. Um, yeah, Jonathan Mannix. I mean, I think um, I think what the, the final bullet is, and this is a lot of the stuff we've been doing in APT Core with our drafts. Um, because this is all one RTP session, you can't actually easily get more feedback for one M line than another in a, in a bundle group. So it probably won't do quite what quite what you want, but it's but what he described here is still the right thing to do. So I mean, we don't have the kind of detailed control of giving more feedback to one M line or another because RTP doesn't work that way. So you won't. So but you know, still sum it up and apply it to the RTP configuration is the right thing to do. Colin James, yeah, that sounds right with my conversation with Magnus. I, but I'd add, I don't know if you have another slide with AS. No, I don't. OK. I think with AS, too, um, Magnus was suggesting only use them at the session level and some. I mean, so only use them at the media level and some across them. So like the RRR and RSs, not like the CT. Thomas Stach. Uh, currently, we have uh, two documents that handle the, the, the bandwidth attributes together with bundling. One is, is your document, the bundle draft, and the second one is the MOOCs attributes. I was going to come to that draft. End. So okay. I, I think we just need one place to define that, that behavior. And okay. probably since there is more text in, currently in the MUX attributes draft, that might be the one to, to take. I, I'm happy to move everything there and just reference it from, from bundle. I have no problem with that. I mean, the issue needs to be solved anyway, right? But, 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 uh, yeah. Um, and uh, Paul Gisvet on the Jabber su suggests that maybe SDP BIS should say that CT is only applicable at session level and, you know, deprecate having CT at media level entirely. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, as a owner of the MUX draft, uh, I think uh, we cover all these things. 
and we say for CT that uh, it makes sense only for session level and it's not impacted. It just take what already have in CT. For AS, we say it applies for only media level and we sum across. And for RS, RR, we just uh, sum across all the media levels. For TIAS, it's special because Magnus gave an explanation which was so complicated I could not understand. And But he suggested it's special because you cannot add the transport headers independent of the payload and it basically increases the uh, bandwidth that you're proposing. So. So I guess I mean the outcome, as far as bundle is concerned, we will we will we will just re we will reference that draft for 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 the bandwidth consideration. So, hi, this is Adam Roach. I just want to make an observation. We keep having people talking about having to go to Magnus, and Ask Magnus doesn't scale to the entire community of internet like authors. I think what we need to do is get Magnus to like put down all of this in text and put it in the SDP BIS draft. We have something to point to when these questions come up. I know this isn't a comment to your thing, but it's like we just need to get Magnus pinned down and spit this out so everyone else can understand it. Uh, <coughs> Ronnie, yeah, the problem, uh, uh, you didn't reference the AS here, but the problem with the AS is that we don't have, a, I don't think, uh, we have an agreement about what you calculate when you calculate the AS. And what Magnus was saying has to do with the part that is the transport because if you, if you bundle then the uh, some of the inf some of the information may not be calculated as as summed as should be so that's I think where we disagree on that but I, I, I think it's th this one are, are no problem except like jo uh, Jonathan said about the R and RS uh, th there is some text now and we discussed it yesterday in AVT core about what happens when you when you have uh, how to calculate the bandwidth and how to use it correctly, uh, the bandwidth, and to have it the right order uh, uh, when you're doing the, the report where you have multiple streams in the same uh, connection. But on the AS, I think we need something to, to say about it because it's being used. But nevertheless, I, I guess the outcome is that we're not going to describe it in bundle. It will be described in, in, in the STP attributes draft. And and, uh, and I guess we'll ask people to look at that. Right? Yeah, I would want to add to that to say, uh, just review it once, You know, whatever we have in the MUX draft. Yeah, OK, so next. I we just. Go on. Next slide, please. OK, the other thing was bus. Uh, the bus software is basically, I mean, just a recap here. I mean, what, what bundle says is that when you send the first initial offer before you have negotiated the usage of bundle, you send a normal offer as described in 3264. You know, each M line has separate address, port com combination, and so on and so on. And then you, in the answer, if the answer is sorted in bundle, you're going to get the same address for each M line. And then in every subsequent offer, you're also going to use the same uh, address port combination in each M line. Well, each M line associated with the bundle group. That's been there for a long time. Uh, bus, the bus offer is about that almost immediately when you have negotiated the, the, the bundle address, is sending one of these new uh, offers with one M line immediately and the reason for that is that you can could have intermediaries that need to have this they don't support bundles so they need to have these m lines with the correct correct address information in, in order to to, to work uh, properly now currently in bundle is said that we have that the sending of this bus offer is, is a should so it's pretty strong so next slide please yeah this is just a text i mean uh, yeah but go on now, what Thomas has been saying here a few times on the list, and um, that uh, we should relax this should, because there are some use cases he's presented where you know you don't want to maybe send this bus offer. There are some race conditions that could occur. There were some three third-party call control and so on and so on. So, so we should maybe add some text about there are cases where you don't need this and so on and so on. Next slide, please. Uh, and also a few words uh, which you heard before from, from the browser community, for example. The browsers will not generate this bus offer 
automatically. I mean, I, the, the, the web RTC API doesn't even support, as far as I know, that the browser suddenly sends a new offer to, to, the, to the JavaScript. I mean, the JavaScript has to ask for it. Uh, so basically, in order to, to be compliant with, with, uh, with, uh, with the bundle draft, it's actually a JavaScript application would have to make sure it creates this offer and, and sends it. So next slide, please. Uh, so what I think about is that if we relax this, this shoot to something else, I, I think you know we we, we we defeat the purpose of the whole bus offer. I mean, the, the, as I said earlier, the whole intention was it to make sure that intermediaries know that they're going to get this information. Um, so next slide, please. So basically, the alternatives here are you know we keep the text that it is, strong should send this. We relax it, come up with some good text, you know, you may or you should unless blah, blah, blah. Or we remove the bus offer completely. Maybe we have a few, a note talking about, yeah, you know, there are intermediaries that may need this and so on and so on. Now, I was one of the strong, I mean, I, I'm the one who pushed for bus offer to begin with, but I'm fine with alternative three and I'm fine with alternative one. But personally, I don't want alternative two because I think it's useless. I mean, if, it doesn't really help anything because you can't really, when, when you have intermediaries, when you do test cases and so on, I mean, it, you don't know if it's going to come or not. So either it's a must or a should or it's not there at all. And then you have to make sure that your applications, because your applications can still do this. I mean, was, as soon as they get the first answer, they can create a new offer where they have AM lines with their correct address and send it. The only thing is that we wouldn't mandate this from the draft. So you could have applications who don't do that and they will still be you know, compliant with, with bundle. So, so my suggestion is that alternative one or three, keep it as easy or remove it completely. Yeah, so, so Martin Thompson, uh, you know, we, we could actually send the Baz offer from a browser by, by sort of nudging the JavaScript with a non-negotiation needed thing to say, hey, you really should do another offer answer exchange here. Um, the reason that we don't do that is because we don't actually want the Baz offer. Uh, so you, you know where we stand from, from the browser perspective on this. I think I, I might safely speak for other browser people in that, in that sense. I know what um, that is. Alternative browser three is prefer preferable here. I, I, I do observe, however, that it, you don't need to say anything about the should strength or may strength if you, if you have specific applications that need the Baz offer. Those specific applications can say, blah 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 blah, must use Baz offer or should use Baz offer in that in that context and and be a little less um, general than you than you are at the moment. Okay. But uh, I, honestly, I don't care about which one of these alternatives we pick. Uh, Mark, can, 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 can you remind us uh, why you don't want to do Baz? I don't think it does any good. This is more more machinery for. Uh, Bookkeeping to keep the uh, the middle boxes happy and okay, so it's basically extra complexity, extra code. Yeah, and um, I haven't seen any evidence any evidence that it actually does any anyone any any good. Thomas Dach, I would be happy with alternative three. If 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 you need that bass offer, of of course you you're anyhow free to to send it. Yeah, I think that would work, and it. It in, if you don't make it mandatory, it, it would avoid all these nasty interactions with isolate uh, agents and third party call control and, and or whatever was presented as causing problems in that area. Colin Jennings, um, I, I don't really care, but I just want to point that alternative three, though it looks different than alternative one, is actually the same as alternative one. Because when you remove the text from this draft, the underlying ice spec already says that you should do this. So I, I mean, we're just repeating what's already there. So I want to just be clear to people that alternative three is not saying don't do this. It's just saying um, don't say it, don't repeat in this spec the other spec that already says you should do this. Yeah, just keep in mind that bundle doesn't mandate the usage of ice. So, so I mean, well, let's be realistic about that. Uh, yeah, uh, this is this is now creating a um, less of a special case for for bundle in that in that sense. Uh, that's true, and what is also true is that subsequent offers will have 
the updated transport parameters in the necessary places. So if someone really cares deeply about the, the, the ongoing welfare of their middle boxes, then they can just do another offer answer exchange uh, and we don't have to describe how they might do that. That's what I'm saying. You can do a create offer as soon as you get the first answer and then exactly. it's done. Yeah. yeah. I mean, maybe not as soon as because well, it's well, resolved, but you know, you wait for ICE to connect and then, and then you yeah. do a create offer if you really deeply care about those sorts of things. And it's, maybe some people do. Um, but we don't have a great deal of evidence to suggest that, that that's the case. So, actually, again, three. Hi, Dale Alderstrom. And I'll turn to three. The discussion has uh, shown me rather conclusively that the need for a BAS offer is application dependent, so we should leave it to the application. And uh, to Karen's comment, uh, the, the, idea, the fact that ICE has made a mistake doesn't mean that we should repeat it here. Let's leave it. Let, let's leave only one place to fix the mistake. Okay. Uh, Ari Karen, I would just like to comment that um, I guess there was a reason originally why it was put in the ICE spec. And does, if someone remembers the discussions back then, the lead this yeah. decision, that would be helpful. Um, uh, Jonathan, I mean, I believe it was in ICE because you have SIP middle boxes that do latching. And if they don't see the five tuples the media is actually flowing on, they think you're doing something weird and slam your so slam your connection shot. Yeah, so the reason so was all more, more or less the yeah, same so thing. I mean, so, and so I mean, so it's pos and I mean, it's possible. I mean, the other, I mean, alternative four might say, you know, should do bass if SIP. Otherwise, who cares? But this is not SIP related. I mean, uh, I mean. Well, the, no, because because the, the only middle boxes that intercept this stuff are SIP, right? Not in, not there are no middle boxes for anything but SIP. And it's no, middle boxes. No, no, that, no, no, that's that's why boxes you see middle boxes. Shipped by more than one vendor at this point. Don't worry. Um, are they We've got middle boxes for everything. Oh, oh okay. three to three. <laughs> everything. Um, it's all are good. They, are they doing latching? Mm, it, it, the, the answer to whether middle boxes do X on all topics are it's very configurable, right? But I keep mean, in mind the Acme. I the Oracle like still shipping this stuff. It's good. Yeah. Keep SIP out of this because I mean you could have I mean for example WebRTC you could use on the wire whatever protocol and you know what you can put a middle box which does whatever with this protocol X that you're using. So I mean, uh, and and I guess uh, I think actually my, my point might be that SIP is the, I mean, if WebRTC sort of by definition, the same people, can, the same organization, same implementers ultimately control the JavaScript application and the middle boxes they're talking to. No? No, because how else are the middle, the middle boxes going to see the, the SDP? Yeah, I can, I can talk to that. Okay. Adam Roach, so I mean, we have this SIP of a WebSockets thing that people actually are playing around with. And you can end up in a SIP domain and go through a SIP middle box on the other end of this thing that's going to suffer if this doesn't happen, right? right. So I think that's, that's the argument here. I'm not saying this should happen. I'm just saying that if you're looking for ways that this yeah. might even marginally apply, that's it. Yeah, but, but Jonathan, but that said, if you're implementing SIP over WebSockets in JavaScript, you know you're implementing SIP over WebSockets. So if this says if SIP, then do this, then you yes. know your if SIP. Yes, that. I and mean, that's what Martin suggested, right? It basically give the applications a way to do this, but don't tell them to do it. Well, They'll no, know when my, they have my to. My point is that in, if, you know, the SIP middle boxes and the SIP endpoints, whether they're in JavaScript or anything else, aren't from the same implementers. And if the middle boxes need this, then they need the SIP endpoints to be doing this. So as a way to try and accelerate this conversation, instead of discussing all the, the details of that rat hole, I mean, it seems that everyone is saying, obviously, the JavaScript applications, if they choose, can do this. So that's why Harold argued for alternative three. I mean, is anyone speaking against alternative three? We've had several people come up and say alternative three. <laughs> I mean, I, I guess my, my, I am arguing slightly against it, which is to say, for WebRTC proper, do not mandate this. Whether you talk about, you know, in, in a non normative way, that's fine. Um, for SIP, um, which is the only case also where you're going to have um, bundled without ice, uh, possibly, um, maybe you need it. And uh, at which point, that's why I'm saying that in that, we mandate it for that, you, for that application in the sense of SIP is an application of, of bundle. But I'm not, yeah. Yeah, so Martin Thompson, I'm a big fan of you ain't gonna need it. Um, and if you can't actually prove to me that you might, that you actually do need it in SIP, 
then um, that seems like something that we could fix later if it turns out that it is actually a problem. I mean, I, I can reply. I mean, there are use cases where, where you do need it, but what I'm saying is that when, when, when you define those applications for the open environments, you tell the one who's writing the JavaScript application, hey, by the way, you need to send this second offer. We, that, 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 that's fine. Yeah, we're, we're, we're talking about, we're but talking we're about what the ITF says about some class of protocols in general. And I, I agree with you, there may be people who, who decide that they suddenly need this capability and they have the means to determine that they need it. Yeah, and, and, uh, and of course by it. time the problem will go away because your intermediaries or whatever you have, they will support bundle. I mean, who wouldn't? So, I mean, it's, you know. So <laughs> well, it, yeah, depends on who you're talking to about that one. Uh, I'd rather just stick three. Thanks. Um, yeah. I would rather not have what you do for different protocols be different in this spec. So I am not in favor of a, a, a different text for SIP and for WebRTC because I'm trying to get those two to converge, not diverge. So if anyone's against that alternative tree, this is a time to speak now or forever be happy with the decision. Okay, so just uh, to be more clear, what is the support for different options? We are going to have a, a quick show of hands. So I'll, I'll be asking for each alternative, and you know, raise your hand if you think that's the right thing to go. So if you think alternative one, keeping the text as it is, would be the right thing to do, please raise your hand now. Okay, I don't see any hands. Okay, uh, alternative two, if you think that would be the right way to go, please raise your hand now. No hands, and then alternative three, if you think that is the right way to go, please raise your hand now. Um, I'm seeing around 10 hands and two from Martin. And, it, and two from Jabber. Okay, so I guess it's pretty clear what is the preferred way forward here. Okay. Excellent. So I remove this text. Uh, I remove the, or add a reference to the SUHA draft regarding the, uh, the bandwidth and submit a new version. And then I guess we should, as I said earlier, we should do a second working group plus calls because there's been so much. Yes. But, but otherwise there's no open issues in the draft. If you think there is, I mean, please, you know, let me know. Yes. So yeah, we will do a second working group last call and and this will be your last moment to review it. So if you haven't yet done a good review of the latest versions, please do it now. Okay, thank you. Ali, you're up. Uh, I would like to give an update on the STP BIS draft. Next slide, please. Uh, there have been two revisions since the last IETF. Uh, these are the things that uh, um, uh, I did in the last two uh, version revisions. So there was a major uh, cleanup and simplifications in the uh, in section six for the attribute definitions, and then uh, section nine STP grammar simplifications. Thanks to Paul. Uh, and then uh, Keith had a bunch of comments uh, uh, regarding um, line versus field, what they mean in different contexts. And uh, um, the, the first two uh, items have been already addressed in the existing revisions. Uh, I already uh, revised, uh, took care of the last three in my uh, working uh, draft, but uh, I haven't uploaded yet. So 
he won't be able to see them, but uh, probably after this week I'll be able to upload the draft. Um, and then there was some editorial cleanup uh, based on Jonathan's comments. And uh, the proposed INA updates are still in a separate draft as we discussed the last time, and I revised that draft, so it's just ready to be incorporated. It's just a big, uh, major undertaking, so I haven't done it yet. But it's uh, quite ready to, to be incorporated into this draft. Next slide, please. So there are a couple of outstanding issues in the uh, tracker, and uh, people just uh, seem to ignore the tracker. So I brought up the questions here. The first outstanding issue is the P time and the max P time. Um, are these always integers? This is not really clear from the current spec. And uh, you know, Paul has brought this up uh, some time ago, but I didn't really get any feedback on the mailing list. So uh, Paul's, uh, Paul has a suggestion, uh, as shown here, uh, the uh, ABNF definition. So we will allow to use of the common values but uh, only if there's a decimal, uh, non-zero decimal part, a fractional part. And um, the same question applies for the frame rate as well. Are we, uh, you know, not every frame rate is just an integer, so we need to allow for uh, decimal values as well. And uh, should we just follow the same ABNF definition or not? That's the question. So if we can make some decisions now, it will be really good uh, for me to, in revising the draft. Yeah. So please speak up. If nobody objects, we will just do this. But uh, unless uh, there are some backward compatibility issues that some people think that you know the frame rate or the um, p time, max p time should be always integers, uh, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, I want, want to drop my, I mean, I think I like this in general. Um, I, think, I don't think you actually mean an integer number of milliseconds. You mean an num integer number of frames per second, right? Frame rate is frames per second, isn't it? Not milliseconds? Yeah. 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 Um, and I think we don't want to allow frame rate zero because I don't know what that means. I think if you don't want to send frames, send, set the stream to inactive. <laughs> well, I mean, is it wrong to set the frame rate to zero? Um, I, I would suspect that there are implementations that will crash because they calculate frame intervals and would divide by zero. <laughs> um, okay. I, I'd say I, I don't see any reason to allow frame rate zero. I think it should be. Okay. It is not useful. If you don't want to send frames, set the stream to receive only or inactive. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Ronnie, uh, if you'll say frame rate equals zero, I would assume that it will be a uh, still image. That's what it will be. It's not. It's not stopping the. the it's not suspending the, the stream because that's what. So that's why it's not clear. That's why you see that's what. Okay. And we shouldn't allow for it. Okay. We shouldn't. Yeah. Next slide. The second outstanding issue is the quality attribute. Um, right now, it is uh, only defined for video, but obviously, quality imply. Uh, you know. Uh, can apply to any kind of media. And uh, we don't seem to allow for fractional values. Uh, do we need to? That's the second question. And uh, uh, right now, the definition doesn't allow for a value of zero. Uh, we think it should. Uh, is there an objection to that? Obviously, we are not going to get into the de details of uh, what quality five means for audio or for this particular I mean, does codec. This have sort of Jonathan, does this have semantics at all? Does anybody use it? Do we want to deprecate it? Uh, well, I don't know whether anybody uses it, but this, uh, right now in this STP spec it says if the quality is 10, that's the best quality you can get. If it is 5, that's the average quality you can get. Actually, it's pretty useless to me, but uh, yeah, that's I mean, what has been there. If nobody uses it, maybe we'll ju we should just remove it. Yeah. <laughs> Because I can't uh, really see any practical uh, implementation. Uh, uh, I agree with Jonathan. We, there's, I'm not aware. It's not clear what it means. Okay, we had those. That's that's. It's called also uh, trade-off. Sometimes it was called in other, uh, in other protocols. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and be, be, between and and there's no clear understanding. So I, I'm not sure anyone is using it because it doesn't mean much. It doesn't. 
And if it's, even if it's being used, the other side wouldn't know what really, yeah. what to expect. You, you don't know what to expect to get when you, you write this, this parameter, because it's not well specified. So is everybody okay if we deprecate it? Yeah. Uh, okay, right. uh, one comment before we do that. Um, is there a good way to find out if anyone is using it? Um, before we go deprecating something, it turns out someone was using and... Paul sent an email to the list. I sent an email to the list months ago and... That was yeah. really I'm kind of concerned outside of the list. Um, um, I don't know how to check that. Yeah, if anyone has a good idea how to find out. Uh, we, we've run into this problem a bunch of times at ITF and the only good way we have is to publish an RFC and then people will complain. <laughs> okay, yeah. and then it's a, yeah, slightly late. Okay. Next slide. Okay, this is a rather minor issue. Uh, RFC 5576 is the source uh, uh, specific attributes, source level attributes. So uh, the current STP draft doesn't. Uh, from the Java room um, to the previous thing, Paul Kizabet suggests asking on SIP implementers and SIP forum. Okay, that sounds like a good idea. Next slide. Um, um, um. So, Andreas. So, so just, I mean, maybe one general question around some of these things, right? When we do a this draft, what we're trying to do is make it better, right? Because there are things that weren't really all that clear in the existing draft. And given that we don't really have a good way of negotiating <coughs> new versions of this protocol, I think we have to be very careful when we start deprecating stuff. I, I think there's a difference between saying that you just carry over what exists currently and is, you know, perhaps not as well specified as it should be, right, versus saying, well, we'll just get rid of it then. So I, I, I am a little bit concerned about, you know, some of the direction that's being taken here where we're just changing things because we think it would be better that way when we know that we're going to be breaking backwards compatibility and we don't really know if it affects anybody or not. So that's a general comment, and I know I have not commented on your uh, <laughs> mails to the mailing list. So, no, consider, I mean you have, a, you have a good point, but then uh, when you really, really read about the quality attribute, I mean that 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 subsection doesn't really tell you anything. You know, you don't know what to do with it. You don't know how to interpret the value. It's it's just pretty much useless. Uh, so why would you why would you carry it over to the next uh, version RFC, right? Yeah, I mean... I think it's a bug uh, that should be removed. Uh, that's what it is. I, I think it's a general question that we have to consider, right? I mean, okay. we just rip stuff out because we don't really like it and it doesn't seem like anybody's using it? Or do we keep it in there to make sure we don't needlessly break anything that people might actually use? You know, as long as it doesn't get any worse or there aren't any known issues with it, what's the harm in leaving it there? And maybe we can leave it with a note. Don't I mean, really I, use this unless you have a I good reason. I would consider that, right? And you could put a note in there saying, I mean, look, this is fairly underspecified, right? And we would encourage people not to generate any of this stuff. Okay. Um, that also works. I mean, that's another strategy, right? That also works. Yeah. So I'm not claiming I have the right answer, but you know, <laughs> I, I am a little bit concerned about some of the direction here. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, well, yeah, I was under the impression that when you do a this draft, then things that are not used uh, that were in the original draft should be deprecated because they are not used and there's no reason to have them there in the first place. At least that's what I heard when I was doing some this draft on, on payload specification. <laughs> Hi, Raul Ostrom. Experience from uh, dealing with uh, old crap in the mail protocols. <laughs> you put the stuff in the ABNF grammar, and you in the in the accept grammar, and you don't put it in the generate grammar. That is, say, never, never create this. Uh, but you have to be able to ignore it if it occurs. Of course. If someone really wants to use it, they can always write another extension spec. In the old days of the, of, uh, 
of, of uh, draft standard, we had uh, the requirement to show two interoperable implementations of uh, quality before it could go into the next version. But uh, those days are not with us anymore. Sometimes I want them back. Okay. Okay, so um, what, I, what I'm hearing is that, yeah, probably using this is not a good idea, but maybe we shouldn't go removing it. Keep it there, clarify that it's not well specified, you shouldn't probably use it, but then again, if you receive it, you should be safe, be able to safely ignore it. Okay. Um, is everyone okay with definition along those lines? Yeah, um, uh, Paul Kisvet says, you know, um, on Jabber, if we if we remove attributes, the defined behavior is to ignore them. So, mm. so in that sense, removing would be essentially the same as we, if you would describe it. Yeah. Okay, um, to be honest, I, I, I'm not that into STP details to know what is, what is the right way to go here, but I mean, let's, for the sake of it, let's, let's take a hum for either removing it complete, I mean, deprecating it, or keeping it in, in a way that we, as, as we described it, okay, it is underspecified, recommended not to use it. So we'll take two hums. First hum is that we will keep it. Christer? Yes, Christer. Uh, I guess it's good to mention also that uh, even if you deprecate it, it doesn't really stop people from using it. I mean, from a standard perspective, it will be an unknown attribute, but existing deployments that are using it, they will use it the same way as, as they have always done. Does uh, the INA register say deprecated, or they just remove the line? I don't know what to do, but I mean, the ABNF allows you, as, or I mean, the protocol allows you to, 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 to receive attributes that you don't support, right? So, right. so this would just be one of those. Mm. Okay, so but my question is, if the INR register removes the attribute from the list, then probably we will just, people forget about it, right? I mean, unless they read the older version. Well, whatever the INR registry table says will be whatever you tell it to say. This is Keith Trage, by the way. So if you want to write this is deprecated, then you basically tell them to do that in this trial. Can I, can I tell them to remove it as well? Is that an option? Well, that's the other option, yes. But I mean, basically, it is your draft that instructs IANA what to do to the table. Oh, the guy over there says no. So, I, I, would, I, would, I would not advise for us to remove it from the IANA registry. That would be a really bad idea because then you'd never be able to find it or figure it out and somebody might use it for a different new conflicting thing. But what we could mark it as uh, it, it can either, in the IANA registry, continue to point at the old RFC, which did define it, and the new RFC just doesn't define it and doesn't update the pointer in the IANA table or, or, or mark or, or refer to it some other way, but I wouldn't remove it from the IANA okay. table. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I can see both sides of the argument, right? But, but I do think that if we do start removing anything, right, given that we're not changing, again, the version number on the protocol, uh, I think it's important that you at least capture somewhere in the document what did you remove and why did you remove it, right? So it's clear to people because, yes, you can always point back to the old spec, right, which yeah. still, from a protocol point of view, is the same version, right? We're not changing yeah. the version number in SRP. Sure. Are you going to take the hums? Okay, uh, let's, let's take the hum on that. Um, so we'll be taking two different hums. <coughs> first, first hum um, is that we keep the uh, attribute in the document and we just in the text specify, okay, here's what it's supposed to do, but it was kind of underspecified, may not be good idea to use it. Second hum is we deprecate it and we mark in the IANA registry that it's deprecated and really say, okay, do not use this in the other versions. Is that clear? 
then you'd be even clearer and say which attribute we're talking about. Is A equals quality, is it? Quality, yes. Quality. Yeah. We're not taking harm on the A equals quality attribute. Yeah. Okay, so the first option, so if you think we should keep it there, not deprecate, keep the, keep the attribute and just clarify the explanation. Please come now. Mm. <laughs> Are you on mic too? <laughs> okay, uh, so then, then, then the second, second option, so we will deprecate it and we will do, do, do whatever it takes to have in the other registry that the market is deprecated, that it will not be used in, in, fut in future hopefully. Please hum now. Okay, I heard a bit, there was small hum on my left on the first one, a bit, bit of hum on, on the second one, but no really. I guess people don't seem to have a strong opinion on this. Um, people just don't just, care. John's not even, on my second point, with, with, the, with the caveat that we should, we should do the call for the somewhat broader forum, see if anyone is using it. Yes, actually, that, that, that's a very valid point. So let's, let's take a call on the forum ask if, if we are using it and then we can take, take that on the list but hopefully close it down. Okay. All right. Next slide. Or Martin, you have still on this one? Yeah. yeah. So Martin Thompson, one final point. I think the onus is on us to keep it. If we keep it, we define what it actually means and what you would actually do with it if you, if you saw it. Um, I'm not sure that that's actually clear to anyone at the moment. And if we get rid of it, that's obviously an easier course to, uh, to follow. So those people actually care about keeping it. I suggest they come up with some... I think they just want to keep it with the additional note saying that don't really use it unless you know what to do with it. Uh, that's, that's their intention. Nobody really wants to you know, assign different meanings to different quality values. And I think we won't really get an agreement on that very quickly. That just sounds like, like leaving sharp objects lying around. I mean, if, if you're going to have a private agreement about what something means, you may as well just have a private agreement and why, why are we writing anything in an RFC? Uh, so sorry, sorry are, so are you saying that we should then, if we keep it, we should better specify what each level means? Yes. So if, if, if seven means something to Fluffy when he's talking to Ronnie over there and it means absolutely nothing to, to anyone else outside of that context, well, that, then they can just talk to each other and work out what seven means and use A equal niceness or something. I don't know. Um, it, it really, it, it's really of no value for us to define something that doesn't actually have any semantics. And that's essentially where we're at at the moment. Mm. Like say star equals yeah yeah. Okay, so we go ahead and check with the implementers forum if this is used, and then go forward based on that. Okay. All right. Um, last out outstanding issue is the source level attributes. Um, now they're on a separate table in the INA registry and uh, the current STP spec doesn't really define the table format. Now that's what we are going to fix in the uh, BIS document. The question here now is should we also move the 50, uh, 55, 76 attributes into this table as well? Or should we, should we keep them separate? Uh, um, I personally think we should integrate them with the other media level and uh, uh, session level attributes. Is there an objection uh, to that? That's your RFC, right, Jonathan? And that's what the table is going to look like, attribute name, usage level. It's going to be session, media, or source, dependent on chart set, yes or no. And then the reference. Obviously, the max attributes draft uh, is going to add one more column into this uh, table eventually. Um, I'm not sure whether that is going to be an RFC before STP yeah. this or not, but. Uh, it makes sense to me. Um, I think. Yeah. 
I think. And, is it, and this also has the ability that if we discover we need new usage levels, we can add them pretty easily to this Correct. without altering the format. Correct. That was the intention. So it looks like there is no objection. Okay. Okay. So uh, my question on that last slide is, is the max attributes draft going to be published before STPBIS? Uh, what's the target date for that one? The max attributes. Yeah, that's going to change the inner registry, and my yeah. draft is going to change the inner registry as well. So yeah, um, we should with, with do some coordination. With with the max attributes, um, we're kind of already think we would be at the IST review by now, but since there are still some open <laughs> discussions ongoing, so yes, I mean I would assume that will be published before okay. STBBIS. So okay. do coordinate on that. Thank you. Okay, uh, next keys and data channels. Okay, so SDP negotiation of data channel sub protocols. Uh, next slide, please. So first a bit of history, um, we adopted this as an M Music Working Group item um, at the Honolulu, meet, Honolulu meeting confirmed on the M Music list. So we finally got the milestone approved in late January 2015 this year. And we had working group versions submitted at the same time. And we've also had a first revision of the documents, the working group documents since then. Uh, next slide. Um, so I've provided some detail on the changes that have taken place. This is the set we'd already agreed at the last meeting that went into the first working group version. I don't plan to say anything more about that. Next slide. Um, you'll find more detail on all of these in the um, draft. I think the only significant change here is that we've been having a discussion and we changed the ordering values from 0, 1 to be true and false. So that it's actually a bit clearer about what they actually mean here. 0 and 1 was a bit opaque. Um, there's also been a bit of restructuring of the document, which is reflected here. So some of the changes appear more significant than they actually were. Um, it's basically trying to describe the text moved around. Um, next slide. Um, more changes. Don't want to say anything about this. So these are all in the current version of the document um, already. Next slide. Um, just to rehash a bit on the problem statement. I mean, basically, what we have is that we've got some data channel usages like, for example, in Clue, and that then means that we've got the ability to send multiple sub-protocols, and this basically provides a means using the new A equals DC map attribute of specifying what protocol is actually used on that sub-protocol, and then when you have attributes associated with that sub-protocol usage, and, for example, MSRP has a number of specific attributes, you then use the A equals DCSA attribute to be able to convey the information about that um, um, sub-protocol that is needed. Um, next slide. Um, so on to the issues. Um, we noted that um, basically we didn't have anything in the document that really said this is only for offer answer and we haven't defined what happens in declarative mode. Um, I think Krista, was it, had a proposal to put this in bundle and it seemed like this would also be appropriate text um, that goes into our document. Um, so if people are happy with that, we'll do that on the next version. Um, nope, okay. Next slide. Um, ABNF rule attribute. Um, basically, we've got currently a statement that the attribute is defined in RSC 4566, but obviously we all know that attributes are defined all over the place in about 20 or 30 different RFCs now. Um, so basically, we just need to, I think, ha make clearer that um, any other specification defining HDP attributes so that people understand it's not just limited to those that are defined in 4566. I think it's fairly simple, but just confirming it here, and we'll put it in the next version. Jonathan Lennox. I mean, this is only semantically for attributes that are actually applicable to SCTP connections, right? It's not like you can put a, you know, an ICE candidate in here or something. So, 
well, it's, it's applicable for any attribute that is appropriate for a sub-protocol. And obviously right. the sub-protocol definition will define what those attributes are. But right. For example, you don't suddenly want to exclude all those that are defined for the usage of file transfer in, in MSRP just because they aren't defined in 4566. Right, no, clearly. No, but I, mean, I think that, so there's this question of what are you doing with the ABN? I guess your ABNF is that it's syntactically uh, and syntactically an, an attribute. Um, well, I think, first of all, we should probably make sure this matches, because we've significantly redone the ABNF and STP BIS. So probably this should reflect STP BIS and not um, 4566 unless we're worried about ordering. Well, I, d I don't know when 4566 BIS is going to be published, but I'm trying to push this far. I understand, I understand but, forward quickly but I mean, the ABNF is one of the things where data data basically the ABNF in 4566 was a mess and we're like, mm. and so we're trying to clean, one of the things that BIS is trying to do is clean that yeah. up, so. Well, I mean the ABNF I'm quite happy to take comments on. I believe uh, Paul Kizovic already did some extensive review of this and he was also responsible for the 4566 take, so it wouldn't surprise me if it's already consistent. But if people have, do have comments then all right. Okay, maybe, so maybe, you know, if you see what, tell me what the inconsistency is on the list, we'll address it. Okay. That if there is an inconsistency. Yeah. I mean, I guess uh, maybe just add the word appropriate SDP attributes in the in your bracket thing, and that's, you know, just to make it clear that no, we only mean things that are actually well, applicable to the. To I mean, the I think appropriate that. SDP attributes were defined in the document that says what you put in the DCSA. So when right. you define a sub-protocol usage, you will say these attributes pro are use, used within DCSA. I think that's what the MSRP yeah, usage I mean, not, is. I, I absolutely agree with that, and I think, I think it would just be clearer, you know, that the thing in your angle brackets is okay. be clearer if you... Oh, I, mean, I don't have a problem with what you've stated. Um, um, note takers, if you could get a record of that. Um, so basically the word is to add the word appropriate somewhere in that text string. Um, next slide. Um, we've got to add the IANA considerations, and we had some discussion on the list on this, and basically, I think the end of, we ended up with a proposal that we reuse the existing WebSockets table. Um, that seemed to be where the consensus in the list ended up as. So basically, what I would propose is that we um, don't change the title of the table, because I think that would cause chaos elsewhere, and we just add a sentence following the table title in IANA saying it also defines WebRTC data channel subprotocols. And the reference, we just add a reference to the, our document in the reference at the header of the table. That will end up meaning that we don't actually have a distinction in the table as to whether the, the, the usage is defined for WebSockets or data channel usage except by the reference used. Um, um, well, because that's what I, I mean, all we get is an entry in the table and a reference. We, if we wanted to say what the usage was, we'd have to add a column to the table and we'd have to do it for all the existing yeah. usages. I mean, do you, uh, Jonathan Lennox, um, do you anticipate that most WebSockets usages will be applicable to data channel? Because I mean, I can't, I mean, like, I don't think anybody's proposing like XMPP over. Well, I mean, if you're following that stream, then you basically say, I think we should have a separate table. I mean, maybe we should. Did you, well, I mean, I mean, how much overlap we, is we there? Put the, the, well, at the moment, uh, there's not really any overlap. I, yeah. mean, I mean, if there's no overlap, I don't see what's the point of using the same table because when I put this to the list, that was the response I got from at least two people on the list. Right. <laughs> One of those people standing right here. Okay. Um, Martin Thompson. The, the, the point here is that there is a significant overlap in, the, in terms of the fact that they use the same API surface. They have or can have the same sort of transfer semantics. Um, I, I believe WebSockets allows for arbitrary size messages and we have limits for data channels, and data channels can do a few extra things that WebSockets can't, but essentially they're the same things. If someone wants to say this only applies to this particular mode of, of a data channel, whether it be unreliable delivery or out of order delivery or what, whatever combination of, of different factors, then that's fine outside of the thing. But um, I will reiterate my point that I've made a number of times regarding the sub-protocol ID. It's pretty useless. So let's not you know, get all excited about how wonderful it is and start hanging all sorts of um, 
things off it because it isn't actually all that useful to people who build applications because they generally know who they're talking to anyway and don't need to signal this stuff. Uh, there, because there was at the mic, I missed, Paul had a comment on the previous slide um, arguing with can, me. Can I just finish this? Oh, sorry, yeah, finish the first slide. We'll get, slide I'll get to it. So, I mean, some, many of the considerations you mentioned, Martin, don't actually be, nothing to do with the INA registration. I mean, all the INA registration does is saying this value is allocated, don't reuse it for something else, this is where you can go and find the usage. Exactly my point, yeah. yes. Yeah. So that's, that's all I'm saying is that having done that, if we, unless we put an extra column in the table, we won't know except by the reference what the usage was defined for. And if someone comes at, I mean basically if it then has a reusage both in web sockets and um, data channel usage, you'd have two references probably but you wouldn't know which one was which except by actually following the reference. Um, that all I'm asking is, are people happy with that? That sounds perfectly fine to me. Yeah. If someone wants to define, uh, to use the same label for different purposes, depending on where it's being hosted, I think we might like to take them outside and beat them until they, we can disabuse them of that notion. But um, if they want to define whether applicability for a particular protocol, or sub-protocol, um, then that's perfectly fine with me. Yeah. Okay, any objections to that? Um, Johnson? I don't know, I mean, what's wrong with just adding a usage column to this table? Well, the fact that we'd have to then go back and basically put the value of that column for every existing entry, and there's about 20 or 30 of them, some of which are user-defined, and I don't think I want to go around the round of asking the individual contributors of those, is this actually valid for what you want to do? So I, we'd either have to leave it empty or fulfill that round of communication. Oh, I see. Yeah. And, the, and the other thing is there that, that, that opens up the, the possibility of saying more than just WebSockets or WebRTC. It suggests the possibility that you might want to describe what sort of reliability and delivery modes that you want to... It, it's, it okay. All right, then this is fine. Yeah. Okay, so basically let's keep it simple. Um, I'll put a quick mail to the list, but I'll assume that people are okay with this, saying what it's going to have. Um, so can you quickly summarize for the note takers? Right. So, so basically what we will do, and I'll put this to, in a mail to the list, is we will not change the name of the table. We will use the existing WebSockets table. We will add a little sentence after it saying it also defines the usage for data channel usage. And basically um, there will not... We will add a reference, there's a reference heading right at the start of the section. We will add a reference to this draft at that point, but within the table itself we will just have the reference and there won't be any distinction between WebSocket usages and um, data channel usages. There is just, to, so just to clarify, when, when you say data channel usages, you also include uh, the values that we're going to include when we, when we use DCEP, the data channel establishment protocol? Because they also had a protocol field, and I, and I see no reason why, why, why we should use different registries for, for that. Well, yeah, but is it the job of this draft to actually do that? No, 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 but uh, it's more a general question. Um, I'd have to go and look at what DSET does, but um, uh, I guess there's some someone here. Huh? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so where does DSET register the, the the protocol values? It doesn't. Yeah, I'm pretty certain it doesn't, but I'm, I, it's a while since I read through it. Okay. Okay, so uh, did Paul have a comment on the previous Paul slide? Paul had a co comment on the previous slide, so if you go back. Um, so on the previous slide, Paul was saying he thinks it's okay as it is without change. He's only defining the syntax of attributes, which is in 4566, not the definition of all possible attributes. So, so basically you think he's saying we don't need this change at all? I think that's what he's saying, yes. Okay. Because it's the, it's the, the, the grammar of attribute is from 4566, which is what this is defining. Mm -hmm. Okay, does anybody else want to speak to, for or against doing anything here? M maybe the answer is we take it out of the um, grammar and then just add a little sentence following it, just explaining what this actually means. Um, maybe another.
maybe do that on the list. Okay. Okay, okay moving yeah. on to the next slide. And, uh, and, and for remote participants, uh, we're now on slide 10 within, within back and forth. Yeah. Did we do slide numbers at some point? I know there was on the original version, then I pasted some slides in. It looks like they got lost at that point. Yeah, it seems where you have too much text there. Oh, right. The numbers don't show up. Right. Um, so, Paul had three comments on the list. Um, so, the first one was what happens when it contains both um, parameters. Um, I can't remember which two parameters it was, but um, we basically, they, they can't both occur at the same time. But basically, we need to define what happens with the receiver. Um, and then I changed the text around to just to make it in the active. Um, so basically that's all that's happened there. I don't think anybody had any problems with final text on the list. So that will go in the next version. Um, number two, I think we're off the bottom of the slide. Um, does it actually appear? Is that all the text on the slide or is it, is it slipped off the bottom? Okay, so there's some proposed text that appeared on the list that basically says the STP answerer um, shall, and is it shall or must? Shall echo the same, I think, but, um, sorry? I don't, I think it must be, sh I mean, it, it, I think it needs to be must because, I mean, I, I don't want to use... I thought shall and must were synonymous. They are meant to be synonymous, therefore yeah. I think it needs to be must, so, okay. All right, so. I need to go and check that one offline. But I think basically we agreed the semantics of what we were going to do on the list. Okay, next slide. And then the final Paul comment. Um, this is the mapping to the data channel. Sorry, the mapping of the yeah the data channel types to the SDP. Blah 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 blah. And we've gone off the bottom of the slide. Oh no, we don't. We agreed. It's so basically, we Paul made a comment. We agreed with it. So this will also go in the next version. Um, go and look at the list discussion for further information, I think. Um, next slide. Set of comments from Christian Groves. I don't think there were any very big showstoppers here. Um, and I think basically we agreed that we would address all Christian's comments. Um, so it's just a question of if anybody wants to say anything here in regard to any of those. Otherwise, we'll just do, deal with them in the next version. Okay, next slide. Um, on to the M-Music data channel usage. Um, so, have we, have we skipped a slide? Oh, no. It's just gone on. To, no, okay. This, sorry, this is the changes from the auth... Yeah, this is the change from the, we agreed in the last meeting to the um, original author draft and the change to the working group draft. So those should all be clear. And then the next slide should be the changes we've made in going from 00, zero to 0, 01 um, since in the version we issued a couple of weeks back. I don't think there's anything significant here that I want to jump up and say this, this is important. It was generally tidying up. Um, if anybody wants to speak to any of those, that's fine. Otherwise, we'll move on to the next slide. Um, so, very few open points. I mean, do we need another applicability statement saying this is only for offer answer in the MSRP document, or is the one that we put in the main document sufficient? Well, at the moment, I think we personally that the one we've got in the main document would be that we said we will put in the main document should be sufficient. In other words, it's only for offer answer, not for declarative usage, and we'll inherit that in this document. Okay, so we won't do anything on that. Uh, and for the note takers, there was some nodding in the room, so apparently, and no one is speaking against, so it should be okay to yep. have it only in the main document. Yep, okay, next slide then. Um, Right, so just to point out that there is a usage, and a different usage to MSRP already defined in the Clue data channel document. Um, I don't think it defines any usage of the DCSA attribute there, if I remember rightly. 
and Clue are proposing to complete their work in July 2015, at least as far as I understand at the moment. Um, so they need the main document ideally to be rolling out somewhere around the same time as that. Um, and that was the last slide, was it, or is there another one? Ah, proposed work plan. Yes. Um, so basically, um, we've got some accumulated changes from this meeting and from various discussions on the list. And I think basically that closes all the open issues we think exist as the editors in the document. Um, the document's already had a number of reviews from various people in M Music and within the Clue working groups. So Christian Groves, Krista Holmberg, Paul Kizivit have all been actively looking at the document already. It would be nice to find another couple of people to read through the document. And that's the next version of the document that we will produce um, shortly after this meeting or at the end of this meeting um, with a fresh pair of eyes. So if there's a couple of people who could stand up and say, I'm going to review this document. Once that's done and we've basically handled any comments they make and any other comments that come on the list, I think we're basically ready for working group last call, assuming you can fit in that into your crowded schedule. Yeah. So yeah, of course, schedule-wise it's going to be interesting, but uh, regarding Keith's uh, first request, um, do we have someone who hasn't yet maybe done a thorough review on the document but would like to volunteer to do one? Okay, Ronnie at least. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, Ronnie Evan, York Meyer, okay. if the note takers could record that. Okay. Um, well, a a anyone else? I mean, two is of course already good, but more okay. people who would like to volunteer for this. And obviously, okay. if you have, you know, in the normal course of discussion, any comments you wish to make, exactly, that's always permitted and allowed. Yeah. And of course, in, in the, if in the crew working group, um, I guess there are people who care about this. So. Sorry, in, uh, in, in crew working group, I don't have, have you, the meeting was already. The, the meeting's already occurred. In, I mean, and it's a number, I mean, the crew working group, I mean, Kristen Groves and Krista Holmberg is the editor of the draft that uses this. So okay. That's why they've been actively looking at this. And Paul Kizovic, okay. obviously, as, as the ex-chair, has a number of bits of familiarity with the clues. So. I think the clue issues are all handled. It's, okay. You know. Okay. Excellent. So, um, so you will be making the changes that. Um, yeah. We, we, our plan is to get something out. You know, basically, as soon as possible. I was hoping Friday. It might be Monday. Okay. And then and that we'll will be a revision a of both drafts. Okay. Excellent. A few additional reviews, and then we can. Can we just get an indication by show of hands? How many people have uh, read? the latest versions of these drafts? Okay. Thank you. Record anything to it? Uh, no, I guess the observation is that, that, that and, and Paul, I guess the observation is that it doesn't seem like there has been a lot of working group review. Um, and Keith, I guess since you are pushing to move the work forward quite rapidly, we would encourage people to really take a look at this. Thank you. Well, I, mean, I think part of it is the problem that some people never look at documents until a working group last call anyway. So. Okay. Then uh, final item on the agenda. To us and STB Proto RTP over TCP. Okay. Uh, this, this draft proposes to use STP Proto uh, attribute for sending several RTP profiles with secure, without secure, with feedback, without feedback, or TCP transport. Next slide. Since uh, during one of the things that came out uh, at the ITF 91 meeting was the draft should be clear in specifying how each layer of the proto attribute uh, is defined and how the framing works over TCP has to be clearly specified with uh, proper appropriate references to the RFCs. So what this new draft does is that it um, clarifies uh, the usage between a DTLS and TLS because there was a confusion on that. And it also tries to clarify uh, the framing requirements when you're trying to send uh, data over TCP. 
and there were several mailing list discussions on this general topic. Uh, it tries to uh, capture that as well. Next slide. Thank you. Okay, uh, first category of uh, the proto identifiers is when you are trying to send an RTP data or you know the secure RTP data over TCP. So what the DAT currently says is that for these three proto identifiers, you send it um, before sending it over TCP, frame it using RC4571 framing and send it. Second category. The second category is that. I think that should be fine. Uh, the, the the picture should explain it. Okay. So in, in second category is when we are using DTLS SRTP to set up the VM. So in that scenario, we take the RTP packet or the RTCP packet and use RFC 576364 kind of DTLS SRTP setup. And whatever data that comes out of that stack, we do 4571 framing and send it over TCP. That's the other two proto identifiers that basically tries to capture that. Third category is is when we want to, when we have a TLS infrastructure set up and we want to use RTP or TLS, in that scenario, what you do is that you take the RTP packets, frame it using 4571 framing, and set up your TLS association using 4572 uh, fingerprint mechanism and send it over TCP. Um, John Max, is there, are there actually people doing this? Because it seems to me that having both SRTP over TCP and RTP over TLS mm -hmm. at this, you know, I think at some point in the past we had a working group contestants that we wouldn't do both. Um, if that's, if people have done both anyway, I'm sad. Um, if people are not doing both, I would not recommend encouraging them to. Okay. So I agree with you, uh, especially the 4572 says that uh, this is not, there are not many supporters of this one, uh -huh. but I heard uh, certain use cases where this is being used. So hence, uh, yeah, I think it's, so I know, it's the usual, the two different ways of doing TLS secured RTP means over TCP means interrupt failures. So no. this this was uh, uh, done, there are products that did this before we had DTLS basically. Yeah, exactly. And, and, yeah, they yeah, and also exist. there were like weird firewall traversal scenarios in which this was done. Mm. So they're not, they're not related in any way. I mean, if people are doing it, we need to make sure it's well defined and that it's then people who are doing it are operable. Just makes me sad as well. So, next slide. So, so uh, can we adopt this as working group document? <laughs> okay. Um, so, obviously, it's kind of kind of kind of early early question for that, but maybe as a more general question. Um, is this, I mean, this now has been, uh, early versions of the draft has been out there now some time, but maybe we haven't really asked from the group, is, is this something that we want to want to fix? Just to make sure of that, that um, everyone acknowledges that this is a problem, or if, if you disagree that it's not a problem, we shouldn't do, the, do this as, at all. So to clarify that, um, if you just take a hum on the room, if you think we should do something perhaps with this document to fix this problem, or if we shouldn't, if this is not really even a problem we want to work on. Or I just have a comment. wanted to make one, one comment about this, which is one of our other draft, uh, one of my other drafts, uh, the JSEP draft right now, um, you know, normatively references this because okay. we need these, we don't have a label to use that's in the registry, so. Um. <laughs> but that pretty much clears that one. Yeah. Okay. So then, what about regarding the approach here? Um, well, one comment was that do we want to do both? Um, sorry? Uh, Jonathan, I don't want to do both. People are doing both, so we should document what they're doing so that people who, so that, you know, they're not doing it completely, you know, undocumented, so. Okay. If, if, if a ship has sailed, then we should document what people are doing. What they're doing may be weird and non-standard, so I don't necessarily want to document that here. I think we're just describing what the standard way of doing it is, which is different, and I think it's fine. Okay, so uh, Bernard, are, are you then saying we should only have one of the ways here? But on, but on the one, the other say, don't do this. 
it's, as, as Cullen said, they're different things. People did this stuff before DTLS SRTP, and if you want to, if, if you were doing that, there was, it should be, there should be an ITF defined way to tell people you're doing that. Right? I, another, it's a totally other question whether you think that WebRTC implementations ought to do that. You, that's, that's a different, th right, absolutely <laughs> not. But, but if you are, if you're doing it, you should have an STP way of telling people you're doing it. Yeah. So, so Martin Thompson, I, I have no problem with putting that particular code point in the document and describing it and put it in the registry and all that sorts of other things. I would prefer that the document say something like, don't do that um, at the same time and, and not get into too much detail about you know, defining it in, in all its gory detail, just simply saying, some people did this, they had this particular protocol stack, don't do that. More like more like the uh, historical RFCs sometimes. Yeah. Um, there you go from from Jabber Paul because that says it should at least be in the ANA registry. So I agree. Uh, um, I I don't I don't want to get in. I just want to register the code point. I want to get into value judgments about whether this is good, bad, or otherwise. I mean, one of the reasons people still are going to continue doing this widely into the future is it allows you to use all your TLS accelerator hardware that you have from the existing web stuff. Um, so, I, I mean, obviously we're not using WebRTC. I'm not proposing we use it there or anything. I'm just sort of saying, like, just. <laughs> The, the, it, we're not defining it. In fact, it is defined. I mean, it, like the, this was when you read the existing old specs, it's it's very clearly defined how you do this. All we're doing is just pointing out this code point that was never really registered. So, I, I, I'd rather not get into saying whether you should or shouldn't do it. This is just updating an IANA table. It's a really simple draft. Yeah, I'm okay with that. Okay, so it seems that we are pretty well aligned on the contents of, of the document and then clear there is need for it. Uh, Jonathan. Okay. Um, Jonathan, so I mean the other thing I think, um, I haven't read the fully scanned it, but I think that we should, should also say that um, if you're doing ICE, that this, this you know, this th the, uh, all the connectivity check stuns are muxed in there and we might need to figure out, um, you know, uh, SCTP over DTLS over T over TCP for because there are because if your ICE negotiates a TCP connection and you're do, doing it, that's what you have. Um, I don't, I'm not happy about it. But so, uh, or is that in the or is that in the? Yeah, the draft currently says there's a section for dealing with ICE. Okay. So it refers to 6544 to saying how the, you need to consider stun and other things. Okay. So so out. should that cite mux fixes if that goes ahead as a draft somewhere? I don't know, 6454 refers mux fixes or anything, but yeah. Okay, I mean, if, I mean, if it depends where this is relative to what mux fixes being a new, new draft, I guess. But. Okay, um, in that case, clearly there seems to be a, a need to do this work, and we are pretty much aligned with the current document, so I guess we should take a, well, we need to discuss with our AD. Um, how this fits in a, I'm clear it fits in a charter and if it should be a part of an existing milestone or if we need a, a new milestone for this. Um, but before that, I guess it would be then appropriate to ask, should we take this as a working group item? So we will, we can take a, instead of previous hum, a different hum. So I will take two hums. First, if you think we should adopt uh, this document as a working group item, We'll figure it out if it's an existing milestone or if we need a new milestone for it. Or second, if we should not take this document. So if you think we should take this document as a working group item, please hum now. Okay, I had a fair amount of hums. And if you think we should not take this document as a working group item, please hum now. And I heard no hums for the second one. Okay, and that was for adopting. Okay, three hums on the chapter room. Okay, bunch of hums also on the chapter room. Okay, so we'll take this with our uh, AD and discuss the way forward. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Shuhas. Um, and actually, since we have now 50 minutes left, what we could do now is um, end the session, but if the guys who had 
who needed to discuss these virtual identifiers, uh, DPLS issues, the team led by Krister. If you guys actually could gather up right now and start the discussion on, on that so we can then you can report back on our Friday session, I think that would be great. Okay, so with that, uh, see you guys on Friday. Thank you.